So let's enter a realm of the fearful and the surreal. The realm of the tall man. As we embrace the Phantasm film franchise. Movie review retrospective. So Phantasm comes to us from the mind of Don Coscarelli, who, before he did Phantasm, did two other films, Jim the World's Greatest and Kenny and Company, which were just little independent films, didn't do anything too fantastically or anything. But Coscarelli got the uh, motivation to go towards horror because he could sell very well and make a good bit of money and get, get his name out there a little bit better. So he pulled a lot of the resources that he had available to him, shot on sporadic weekends throughout a whole year or so, and it came out in 1979 with Phantasm. And on a budget of $300,000, Coscarelli makes Phantasm look very, very good. That This isn't just amateur filmmaking. This is shot and directed by someone who already has a certain amount of knowledge and experience in making films. Coscarelli did a lot of the cinematography and camera work himself, in addition to being writer and director and a lot of other things on the film, he just put together a very solidly well-shot film that in a lot of ways exceeds its limitations because, yeah, some of the effects are really kind of cheap and some kind of silly or whatnot, but the concepts behind everything are very strong. The imagination on display from Coscarelli in this whole series is just wonderfully innovative and so fresh and original that that this is a franchise that never really kind of laid back on anything, never tried to just kind of coast on anything, always tried to do something a little different with each entry. And the first film, I just loved the first Phantasm because of that fantastic, surreal atmosphere that it has that you can never be certain exactly what is reality here, what is... Is it a dream? Is it an illusion? What's really going on here? Just, I love that feel in this film. It just, of all of the Phantasm films, I think this one has the strongest horror atmosphere of anything. The most consistent type of atmosphere. It just feels the most like a pure type of horror film in a certain way. I mean, I just love Coscarelli that he puts together so, he's never just going for one type of thing. He always wants to blend a couple of genres together between horror and science fiction and fantasy. It's all right here in this film, and I just love how he blends it all together in this very kind of mystifying package of sorts that the film absolutely has its mystique all over the place. But it's really how you see the whole film. The whole story is really through the point of view of Mike Pearson here, and this little kid who it's like... This kid who's had his parents die, and and there's all these little things, little twisting and turning ideas throughout the whole film, all the way up to the end of exactly what is going on with this kid. What is, what's really happened to this kid in reality? And I think Michael Baldwin does a really fine job that Coscarelli had already used him before in Kenny and Company, and he's just a really good young actor in this film, that he brings all that great use youthful inquisitiveness and everything that you really get that freshness and that curiosity of youth and everything through his character and how he portrays it just like every little thing you see from him just like it just takes you back to a young age and everything and overall I think the film has strong solid characters some of the acting not not fantastic I mean obviously Angus Scrim is probably the most uh, seasoned actor of them all and he does Obviously, the tall man is probably one of the unjustifiably so undersung horror icons because you got all the big high tier ones your Freddies, your Jasons, your Pinheads, your Michael Myers, the Draculas, and all that kind of stuff. But Tall Man is such that great character, a fascinating mystique who's never lost anything in any of these films. He's always been held up on such a rock solid integrity level. He really deserves a lot more attention and praise. This is one of those franchises I feel is never quite... Obviously from a lot of stuff I'll get into later on that never really broke through on that type of level. To be that mega success type of thing. It's always been one of those kind of cult franchises and whatnot. Kept going by the love of the fans. 
And Tall Man obviously absolutely has been a little bit undersung in my view, but Angus Scream does such a fantastic job of this character. Everything he does just shows that, that one, he was a seasoned actor at the time to really bring forth such a great physical presence and atmosphere and chilling quality to the the tall man himself. But I think Bill Thornbury is probably the next best actor in the film. He just feels very natural in everything he does. But he just feels like the strongest character, the strongest actor outside of that. And uh, I think I like the character of Jody because he is a very... He, he does, definitely feels like that big brother who does feel like he wants to move on to the next level of his life. But he still feels a lot of care and attention towards his uh, kid brother. And I think Bill Thornbury does a very strong performance in that type of way, just adding those great qualities of the film. And obviously, Reggie Bannister, I'll talk a little bit more about later, but he definitely grew into being the heart of the franchise overall. And you just can't deny uh, the importance of him in this franchise. But I think everyone does a fairly good job that... I love the family dynamic. The family story and the whole thing is very strong and kind of unique. That is not the type of thing you would see in anything that would be horror related more or less. Not typically anyway. And just, it's all, the whole story really is kind of built a little bit on that in the background. It's just a thread that flows through everything. And that brotherly bond between Jody and Mike is very strong in the film. You just feel a very authentic, natural connection between these two characters. It's just great that you got Mike is the brave one, Jody's kind of the tough guy in the whole thing, and Reggie's just kind of the cool guy off to the side a little bit. Kind of like, I like when you get those moments where Reggie just kind of stumbles into a very strange situation, and he kind of, he, he kind of rolls with it eventually. It's just like, great characters all around in this franchise, and especially this first film, really sets them up in a very good way to really endear you with a lot of charm in them. And... It's nice that the film just has these nice twists and turns in it that it starts out in a very... kind of has that mystique going, a little bit of that atmosphere and everything, just little things here and there just kind of give you a sense of things are not quite right. And things progress to a certain point where it becomes a bit more of an action horror mystery type of thing. Where you got the shotguns coming out and the Hemikuda, car chases, stuff blowing up here and there, just like... This is a film that really kind of try to hit you on all different levels, really entertain you, and create a very intriguing package altogether. And it all just comes together in such a fine blend of horror and sci-fi elements that really do get to chilling you at certain points in time. I just love how this film has so much mood to it and uses so many shadowy visuals that just get you really kind of scared. I just think this film just has enough type of spooky, eerie elements to it that just really kind of make it a much more of a, a great horror experience in a certain way that the atmosphere, the surreal qualities, the tall man himself, that he's just this eerie, creepy figure that you really can't figure out here and there whatnot. Just so many little things like uh, when Mike, we get that dream moment what whatnot where Mike wakes up in his bed and he's suddenly in the cemetery and a tall man's over him and the minions grab him whatnot just like there's so many great moments or like when Jody do dozes off and he appears in the mausoleum and the tall man's walking towards him the film just uses so much great atmosphere and mood to certain extents that it just like really kind of creeps you out kind of just gets you spooked or whatnot I just that's what I love about this film this film just does great stuff all the way through. I love the characters, love the whole mystique of it. Yeah, some of the effects are a little cheap here and there, but again, the mystery, the ideas behind everything are so damn good in my opinion that you can overlook it and still get some charm from it, that you can see that these are people putting a lot of ambition into what they're doing. They've got great ideas, they got the fucking spheres boring into people's foreheads and everything. It's like, enough stuff here slam bangs you with a great idea or whatnot to really just hook you in all the way through first phantasm movie i think is a fantastic piece that grows a hell of a lot of money three hundred thousand dollars earned 12 million at the box office i say that's a great return 
But Phantasm really didn't go anywhere from there on out. It really took another nine years before anything materialized for a sequel. In 1988, we got Phantasm 2. And for many people, Phantasm 2 is their favorite film of the whole franchise. This one has a very strong fan base. But because Cost Greatly had to go through Universal Pictures to get a nice $3 million budget to do the film, they imposed a lot of mandates upon him to make it a much more wider appealing mainstream type of movie, which means all the surreal elements and the dreamlike qualities of the first film had to be stripped away. And that's the thing I loved about the first film, all that kind of stuff, that great mystique and aura and everything, going out the window. So this leaves Phantasm 2 as much more of a kind of a fun little action, slightly horror type of film that is still extremely entertaining. It has a lot of stuff to really love about it. It is a very fun type of movie, but it does lack that compelling atmosphere. It doesn't have a lot of things that are really going for suspense or real horror type of things. Yeah, it's plenty gory. This film has plenty of gore, plenty of bombast and everything. This veers it much more towards an action type of film, kind of kind of Evil Dead 2 Army of Darkness type of territory. It's much more going for high camp entertainment value than really kind of a serious type of horror atmosphere. Which is really kind of more like where this that's where I like the series. But Phantasm 2. It's still a very solid, entertaining type of film that ultimately, a lot. I don't like kind of giving it praise and then pulling something away from it. But that's kind of how I feel about Phantasm too. That it exceeds on the base level of entertainment value. But really doesn't have anything else to offer. It doesn't push forward the mythology very far. It doesn't really push the characters very far. Just kind of like we're, we catch up with the characters, we establish where they are. And then this is a point where we can jump off on and really explore a much more in-depth, intriguing type of story. And one of the other mandates they put upon it was that you got to recast the role here. We need something. We need someone that's filmed that's more marketable in a certain way. So Cosgrave had to balance between Reggie Bannister and a Michael Baldwin, and Reggie won out. So character of Mike Pearson was now recast with James Legro, who is a very good actor. He's done a lot of really solid type of work. And he does a good job in this role, but you can definitely see in retrospect, it doesn't really flow. It doesn't really fit overall where they wanted to push the character later on because he's much more like the whole film's pretty much set up as is much more of a kind of gung-ho type of action movie, road movie type of thing. And Legro is a solid action lead with a decent amount of dramatic talent to him that he really holds his own throughout the whole film without any problem whatsoever. But it really kind of seems that they wrote him with a little less dramatic overall depth to him that see in the first film he's got a lot of things going on as this young kid and later on they forge him into a completely different style of character. But overall Legro does a solid job with the material that he has, really pulls the film through. But of course, yet another studio mandate was putting in a nice little unneeded, unnecessary love story that you can see in the next film that, since we didn't have any studio mandates, throw it out the window. But obviously, they got Reggie Bannister here where I think in this film he absolutely begins to forge his legacy as this great sort of B-movie fucking icon and whatnot that he just is that great, fun, cool hero that you can get behind and really forges himself as the absolute heart of this franchise that it wouldn't be the same without Reggie. I could say that Michael Baldwin does a fine job in this role in the, all the other films. There's just something about Reggie Bannister himself that just like he has that certain heart and charm that there's only one Reggie Bannister, unfortunately. And just like you put anyone else in the role, it just doesn't quite have the same added value to the film that Reggie is Reggie, and you gotta have Reggie there, and he just adds so much great things, including the iconic quad barrel shotgun. 
This film just adds these extra added iconic elements to it in this film that you cannot take away from it at all. Absolutely, that this film just lays a great groundwork for things. I like that, yeah, it has higher quality effects. It builds itself up better. It looks like a much more highly polished, good-looking film. That shows that this film franchise can grow into something a little bit more expansive or whatnot. I like the quality that it is this type of road movie type of thing where it kind of opens up the scope of the whole thing. That a lot of other like horror franchises and whatnot, they're very localized. They're very much like Friday the 13th. You're in this one woods in this one little town or Halloween is Haddonfield or whatnot, but some things like a Hellraiser or whatnot that really open up a great scope to things and this is an interesting type of thing that if you're a fan of this, just occurred to me, if you're a fan of this show Supernatural, you can definitely get a really good correlation there that guys in a muscle car going cross country and everything, battling evil shit, Supernatural shit. Kind of a good little allegory there. If you like Phantasm, you probably like Supernatural too. So a lot of the same elements there that really kind of forge you there. So, uh... I mean, this film adds in a lot of humor, a lot of great stuff to make it just push that entertainment value right up the scales. And there's a lot of clever action, some great action set pieces and the thing just, it, it just ups the scale of things, just ups the ante of everything, just gives it more bombast, more punch, more uh, bang for your buck sort of thing. And great cinematography too, just like you can just see that this film was just completely in a studio type of realm but just it just got so much to offer you in a certain way that if you really like a good solid sort of slickly directed and shot and everything type of B action movie of sorts with a lot of mixture of that horror and sci-fi type of thing absolutely Phantasm 2 hits it right on the nail and the $3 million budget brought back a $7.3 million box office take so not as successful as the first film, and don't know if it really met expectations, but the fact that it went completely direct to video after this might say a little bit about how Universal Pictures really viewed the Phantasm franchise of what they had. And so, 1994, we got Phantasm 3 Lord of the Dead, which is. A great sort of return to the surreal atmosphere and everything. There's just so much little things and a lot of great things in this film that really mesh together what you had in Phantasm 2, but bring back all the great elements of the first Phantasm. They just meld together in some interesting and very good and some not so good things. For a long time, it was like Phantasm 3 really kind of had my uh, great appreciation. It was like the one that really kind of did something extra for me in the franchise. But watching again, there's, like I said, some good things, some not so good things in this film, but obviously the good thing appeals to me the most that you get back all the dreamlike, haunting, atmospheric qualities that really make Phantasm what it is in my eyes. And again, because you don't have Universal Pictures butting their nose in, it's like they don't really care that much, you get back. Michael Baldwin is Mike Pearson and you get the return of Jody Pearson so that brings back Bill Thornberry so you got the nice full cast reunion from the first film everyone's back in here and you really get that great sense of just a family coming back together for a great new adventure and everything it feels whole it feels complete and it feels like this is exactly where the franchise needs to start veering itself back towards make it much more interesting bring back the mystery and all that great intriguing qualities they had in the first film to really thread through a much more fantastic and expansive and interwoven type of storyline that just can go in so many fascinating directions. And this film also had not that much lower of a budget. It had a $2.5 million budget so they were able to maintain a certain level of production quality from the previous film. But Universal Pictures really didn't bother to give it much much of anything beyond it, but it became one of the highest uh, selling video cassettes of that year, but you don't really have any figures off you to sell, tell you how successful it was. 
But uh, I just love that this film has introduces a few new charming characters, new characters that just feel right in this whole thing. That first you got the kid of Tim, portrayed by Kevin Connors, who uh, kind of brings back a little bit of that same feeling you had from Mike from the first, from that youthful type of energy and quality, that kind of charm and whatnot, enduring quality. But this is a kid who's obviously been through the ravages of the tall man's uh, wake and everything. He's been fighting off uh, his minions and all this kind of stuff for a while, so he's much more of a a tougher kid in a certain way. He's not going to be left behind. He's not going to fall back on any, behind anyone. He's really fighting his own fight in the whole thing. So, a nice little twist and turn on that. And got this nice character of Rocky. That, uh, this tough soldier who just really kind of has a great camaraderie and chemistry with Reggie in this film. That it's kind of sexual tension kind of thing and whatnot. But it just, it plays out in a very good way throughout this whole film. It's nice to have an, an extra kind of badass character in there to really kind of change up the dynamics a little bit. Just add a little something more into the characters of the whole film. And, and talking about the character of Mike Pearson in particular, because with Michael Baldwin back in the role and all that studio mandate stuff off Coscarelli's back, he began writing the character in a much more intriguing type of way. Moved him away from the action-heavy type of stuff and towards a more cerebral and intriguing type of character because Phantasm 3 begins to explore some very startling revelations and origins of characters, unknown, unspoken backstories begin to creak their way into the storyline here in extremely fascinating type of ways. It's like this opens up it beyond just a couple of people hunting down the tall man just to stop him. There's a lot more frightening type of stuff lurking beneath the surface everything and makes for a very intriguing story because about the first hour of the film is really kind of setting up and really kind of doing the action heavy road movie type of stuff. Last about half an hour of the film focuses in on all that stuff amps up the intrigue and the mystique of everything. Get some really moody type of visuals and everything in there too. Really good uh, cinematography in this film, but it's that added qualities of the story to showing you where this whole thing is going to evolve towards from here on out that makes it much more fascinating and intriguing type of storyline. But overall, Phantasm 3 has a little bit of hit or miss qualities, like I said, because there is some campy humor of sorts in here, because a lot of the humor from all the heroes and everything is very solid. I like it. No problem whatsoever. But you introduce these sort of three tacky fucking thieves in the film. They keep popping up over and over and over again not very well welcomed in my opinion that it's like they add just a bit too much of a tacky campy quality to the film that they're just really there just to have another obstacle for the heroes to overcome instead of encountering a lot of regular tall man minions like the grave diggers or the dwarves or whatnot or more spheres or whatnot really they just keep encountering these people even after they've been killed they brought back as minions or whatnot so they just Eh, it's not it doesn't really, never really struck me very well. I always felt like it kind of degraded the film, uh, its entertainment value to a certain extent for me. But thankfully, they're used pretty sparingly. But they do they're repeatedly brought back as regular foes whenever you need a new action sequence or something like that. So it's just like eh, I could have done with something a little better. But despite how much this film really kind of went over well with. Uh, fans and whatnot became a very hot selling VHS title and everything. Coscarelli's always had that problem that the film has never, the franchise has never been that big huge type of hit that's like someone really wants to cash on it really bad. So it's always been a struggle for him to really come up with money to continue doing the franchise and that ends up being 1998's Phantasm Oblivion which is a film that Universal Pictures is out of the whole thing. They're not funding it. Cosgrave really had to come up with all the money on his own. 
So this dips down to about a $650,000 budget. And there's a lot of history going into this film because there were two different scripts written for a much bigger affair. One called Phantasm 1999 AD, another one was kind of rewritten, same script pretty much, just rewritten to Phantasm's End later on. But there are much larger scale type of films being written and he couldn't get the money to make them. So Phantasm Oblivion, this fourth film in the franchise, is a film that I do like. But it ultimately comes off as a filler type of movie that is like, we can't really make the film that we want to make. So we're going to do sort of a holding pattern type of film to introduce enough concept, kind of push the mythology forward, but we can't really have a big send-off. We really can't have a big bang here or whatnot. It's just more of a setup type of film to really kind of like, okay, we can explore some ideas, we can push the characters forward, just kind of build on some of the intriguing qualities Phantasm 3 did, exploring more origins, trying to get into the, the backstories more so we can push forward whenever the hell we can make another movie. And this film is almost fully about the surrealism and the mythology of Phantasm because it's got the whole runtime to do so. Might as well go as in-depth about it as possible with some very intriguing revelations and a dancing around with time travel because you're doing phasing through dimensions and all that kind of stuff. So Mike Pearson gets a little peer into the past and a hint at the future because there's an idea in the Phantasm's end script about a future where plague is running rampant and Tall Man's pretty much left America's this desolate wasteland and everything. So a couple little things to kind of taste, a little bit of tease here and there about things for a much more wider expansive script and all that kind of stuff. And it's very fortunate that Don Cosgrave had some sort of very good relationship with KNB effects who are just absolutely incredible group who did fantastic makeup effects for a very long time in the 90s and they were willing to help him out on this film to come on break have access to all their great magnificent makeup effects work for a very low cost so even though the film doesn't have a great budget it is a very restrictive budget where you don't have a lot of production value to show off a lot of the film is just set in the middle of the desert where you don't have any sets or anything to really show off, you still get the benefit of very good effects. And that really helps things sort of in the reverse from the first film, that you get a lot of really good high-end effects with a very sh short, limited budget. And one of the things that Kost really did to kind of meld this film around a budget that really didn't allow for a lot of freedom was that happened to find a lot of cut footage from the first Phantasm and wrote around a lot of that footage to integrate it somehow into the story here and into more dreamlike qualities, surreal elements, stuff like that to really kind of harken back to the first film and kind of strengthen its ties there because you get the fortune teller from the first film comes back you get a little things like Reggie puts on the old ice cream vendor uniform in the final act of the film that you just get these little things in the film that just really tie back to, to the first movie. A really smart type of charming type of ways that, yeah, this film can ultimately kind of leave you kind of wanting for something more because you just feel like it's all set up, no real payoff here. And absolutely that is the way it is with this film that it really doesn't pay off anything. It just like I said, pushing things forward to a certain extent where you can go off and have the big blow-off adventure. But this film still has a lot of good stuff to offer, a lot of good haunting, spooky atmosphere, and a really good fucking ending, too, that cliffhanger of all real cliffhangers. Shit gets fucking, really fucking bad at the end of this film. It's like, oh, that's a cliffhanger. That's a cliffhanger if there ever was one. And... Phantasm Oblivion. It's an okay film. I don't think it's bad at all. But we've been waiting since 1998 to get a fifth film in this franchise with a lot of false starts, a lot of things like it got to a certain point with New Line Cinema and then it just kind of fell apart. And Cosgrove's been working and working and working in secret. And it seems next year 
we will get Phantasm Ravager, the fifth and purportedly final film of the franchise. We'll see how things go, because again, didn't get a lot of, had to raise a lot of budget on his own. So the CGI doesn't look all that fantastic, doesn't look anything better than what they had in 98. We'll just have to see how it turns out next year when they finally get it released, because it's a bit of a slow going process. Get music together and all that distribution type of stuff going, but I think the Phantasm franchise is one of those that really deserves a lot better than what it's gotten overall with the mainstream type of uh, exposure it's not gotten, the uh, faith from studios that it hasn't gotten that it's one of those things that start off with such fantastic ideas. As soon as it gets in the hands of a big studio, just think about the bottom line, really kind of snuffs a lot of that stuff out and then once you have the freedom of not having them on your back then you really don't have the freedom to actually do what you want to do because you don't have the money you don't have the budget to do it so as an independent filmmaker myself i absolutely know that fucking frustration that you have such great ideas and you have such ambition you don't have the money you don't have the resources to make it happen and that's something that just keeps stinging coscarelli in the back time and time again with this franchise and I completely empathize and sympathize with that and I just hope that with Phantasm Ravager when it comes out that it is satisfying that it gives us one thing that the Phantasm franchise has never given us is the expected never gives you anything that you expect nothing predictable in any type of way that like I said Cosgrave's imagination is so fertile that he's always got something new and something completely startling and fucking amazing to offer you and every single film that goes forward just like so many great ideas that he just comes up with that are fun that are scary that are intriguing everything that he does really kind of is just one of those filmmakers that he just again just the same thing with a franchise deserves a whole lot more confidence from the studio system than he's ever gotten because the guy just he's a fantastic filmmaker never seems to run out of really good ideas so phantasm franchise guys even that theme i wanted to say so many things about scores in this thing but to wrap it up i love the phantasm theme i've been hooked on a little bit this halloween season everything is like fred myro's phantasm theme it's fantastic that haunting melodic quality just like Ooh, man, that deserves right up there with the theme from Elm Street and Halloween and Hellraiser and everything. Just deserves to be right up there, right up there with the rest of them. Just the same as the franchise. Beautiful, wonderful artistry and work throughout this whole franchise. Just everyone just put so much passion and so much love into everything they did with Phantasm. Deserves so much more. So you tell me what you guys think. But each one of these films in the franchise, which one is your favorite? Which one really does the most for you on different levels? Because, like I said, each one has a little bit of something different to offer you. So, uh, before I run out of steam here, I'm going to close this off. And I'm hoping to get at least one more video for you guys. Maybe it shows up a little late here. But I hope to get at least one more review for you guys done before the end of a forever horror month this season this year but running out of steam at this point in time in this video so i'm going to close it off and say thank you for watching or post some comments below and uh hit some like buttons thumbs up and all that stuff i gotta get to work on some more videos so see you guys later and uh forever horror month will hopefully continue and conclude soon so take care bye bye